The retailer explains that he hired an African-American man named George Washington Jackson, a former porter, to help around the shop. Soon, he notices that Jackson is talking to an African-American woman who comes in and to shop. Um, the African-American woman leaves with a gang of records in his arm. Jackson makes the sale. But Jackson also acquires from her a list of all of her friends and family who own phonographs, and a list of uh, all of her neighbors that uh, might be interested in one. Jackson begins canvassing the black neighborhoods in the town in order to uh, follow up on this list. And soon, uh, uh, African-American trade is constituting a, a significant portion of the shop's business. Right? Middleton insists that black consumers were deeply knowledgeable about music. And as I said, there were very few recordings by black artists at this time. But he says that uh, black uh, um, consumers in this town were hyper aware of which records had compositions by black composers sung by white artists. And they, they tended to support the black composers who had gotten their songs on record rather than uh, even sung by white artists. This, I might say, kind of challenges a lot of the language of the emergence of race records that we, that we had known. Um, he, he cites uh, the composer J. Tim Berm and uh, the lyricist Paul Lawrence Dunbar as being particularly popular um, with black residents of this town. Then the jobber says, son, the black man is greatly misunderstood. Jackson succeeded, he explained, because he is, quote, he is dealing with his own people. Being a student of human nature, he knows their weaknesses, their likes and dislikes, and can therefore cater to their tastes in a most satisfactory manner. 